All right, welcome to the 11th lecture of mathematical finance. Um, let me share as usual my screen. So what we started discussing last time um, was the first fundamental theorem at asset pricing. And well, one of the main goals for today is to complete the proof. Um, so let me first recall what is the aim for the at least first half of the lecture. Um, so this is or was theorem 319, which is the first fundamental theorem of asset pricing. All right. And the content of this theorem was to say, well, if I have a finite financial market, Um, as usual, consisting of a risk-free bond, risk-free asset, B, and D, risky assets here denoted by the vector ST, and they have a price evolution in discrete time, then this market is arbitrage-free if and only if the set of equivalent martingale measures is non-empty. Right, so this is well, Q, uh, which is a probability measure. So Q is a Martingale measure, meaning the discounted price process is a Martingale, a Martingale measure. And we want that we consider those martingale measures which are consistent somehow with the underlying uh, probability space or with the underlying financial market. So we want that the martingale measures we are interested in are equivalent to the underlying physical measure P. Yeah. Um, and actually the, the direction if we have a martingale measure then the market is arbitrage free, was already proven last lecture. So we will focus on the direction. If the market is arbitrage free, then we can indeed construct a equivalent martingale measure. Um, and for this purpose, we started considering two sets. Um, the first one was. Uh, so let me also read. So, so we wanted to consider a finite probability space. And this is actually not needed for the statement of the um, first fundamental theorem and asset pricing. So the first fundamental theorem and asset pricing holds for general markets. So could you make here the bracket again? Uh, but in the course, we will only prove at least the one direction uh, for finite dimensional probability space. And the reason for this is um, that we can identify vectors um, with probability uh, with random rival. So if you have a random rival on such a finite probability space consisting of M elements, then um, this allows us to identify random rivals x on this underlying space omega when vectors in Rm, right? By what we what to we simply define now, if you have such a random rival and vector x1 to xm by evaluating the random variable at each of these omega one up to omega m. Uh, m. This allows us to work with real analysis in contrast to abstract functional analysis, which is required for the um, general 
statement. So if you consider general probability spaces, we need also more abstract functional analysis, which unfortunately you haven't had in the first two years. All right, so that's what the motivation to, I mean, this identification was to, um, to consider sets in Rn. And so the first set were called L, which are all basically gain processes. So these are all um, vectors in Rm, which can be generated by trading in the underlying market. And so can be represented as a gain process. So this, and this is a predictable. So the set A was a set of predictable processes. Um, and this in with values in RD, so they can always be a hands to the um, to self-financing trading strategies. Okay, so these are our gain processes, and now we wanted to consider also all claims which are dominated by gain processes. So these are all vectors which can be dominated by a, another one y. And this means component wise. So for some L in y. Right. So to be precise, um, for up to All right, and this is of course again. Okay, these are the, the two sets. Um, we wanted to consider, and now we well, started like constructing a probability measure, but first we had to do, um, I mean, in order to construct just a equivalent martingale measures, we needed to prove some separation theorem in Rn, which we have done. And the, the point of this separation theorem comes now, at least in our contract, context. Um, this was where I stopped last time. So this was lemma 3.1. Which we're telling you, well, if I have uh, let's say payoff Z, which cannot be dominated by a uh, game process. Well, so this is still a, it's a random rival. Um, or in our case, vector in I. Okay. So if we have a payoff which cannot be dominated by a gain process, well, then there exists a martingale measure with the signs this, to this payoff strictly positive expectation. So this means if we are not able to like hatch or super hatch um, this payoff with the initial capital zero, then there's six, um, exists a martingale which assigned them a strictly positive price. Okay, and this is what we need to prove now um, in order to prove the fundamental theorem as a price. All right, so let's start with proof. Um, okay. What do we have to do? Well, let us fix now the Z, which is not in Z. Um, and the first observation we have, if we look at this set Z, well, I mean, we want to apply our, apply our separation theorem in Rn. So let's have a check that we have the ingredients for it. Um, so, what we note is, well, 
you look at that, is uh, closed and convex set in RM. Right. Or if something is dominated, we can also take a convex combination and find the corresponding gain process is also just given by the convex combination. And since we have here less or equal, we have closed, closed convex coin. Um, and second thing is, well, we consider this single element, it's not in Z. Uh, okay. So what does mean? Well, this is our separation theorem. Uh, this tells us, well, they exist linear map L, uh, the linear maps are just given here. I mean, in RM, they are just given by constants. So this is our linear map um, for some vector A, and this is the vector, right? So RM and well, there was this gamma, so constant, such that, well, what you had um, to recall. So if we apply H to, uh, if you take an H in H and C, well, this is, the linear function LL assigned them value less or equal than gamma. And if we have um, apply this fun uh, linear function to Z, um, well, this is, gives you a value strictly bigger than gamma. So this linear function separates the set C from the single turn, so this single element Z. All right. And now, well, let's spell out the definition here. So what is this? This is the sum from I to one up to M of A Y I multiplied with Z I. And here, We have again the sum, right, this is just plugging out, I mean, plugging in the definition of L. So this is the sum from one to M of AI multiplied with HI. Okay. No. Um, in my first claim, well, this is, I mean, this is just the statement of the separation theorem. My first claim here is, we can actually choose gamma to be equal zero. Okay. Um, I have to prove this claim, right, if I make it. Um, let me change the color. Um, okay, so what's first observation I have? Well, the zero element is in Z, right? So if I want to super hatch, uh, with the gain process, the payoff zero, well, I just take zero as position. Um, and so this isn't that. So here you can see different Z again, it's straightforward to see this. Um, but this means, um, that here the L of L of zero is zero, so L of zero is equal to zero because the uh, linear function, um, and this means this has to be bigger than H. Right. Right, let me give this a number because do we need this observation data. Okay. Um, this is the first one. Now the 
second of, I mean, so, um, so gamma has to be less or equal than zero. Um, and now we observe, well, if we have an element in Z, so H in Z, what we can see is we can scale it up. Right? So if this H is dominated by a game process, well, we can scale up our game process. So we know that if we multiply with this with the constant N, N multiplied with H is also in Z. This is what I said, it's a convex coin. Um, so it's for all N in there, right? Um, so what we plug it in, I mean, using here our statement from the separation theory is so N times linear functional, right? this is here the left-hand side of the above equality, this has to be less or equal than gamma for all n in n. But we have assumed that, or we know from the statement that this gamma has to be infinity, uh, less than infinity, right? This is a constant in Rn uh, and R. So what it means, and this holds for all, it's independent of H. So this means my scaling argument, well, I scaled, the can they scale this up? So this term here has to be negative. So what we get is that H is less or equal than that. Okay. So this is, so you see here, we can indeed choose gamma to be equal to zero. Okay. Um, now we want to use this to construct a probability measure um, based on this linear function. So how do we proceed? Um, first thing I want to do is I want to consider a random variable um, right, given by the indicator function minus the indicator function of an element omega i. And I have this is, can do this for all m, so, so all elements in the probability space omega, or sample space omega. Right. So what we see here is, well, this is a negative, I mean, a non-positive random variable, so we can easily dominate it by a game process, for example, just take zero. Um, so it's again an element in Z. Um, whereas, right, this is less or equal than zero and this is dominated by the game process generated by zero position. And now we use, oh, what I forgot to label, the condition year. Um, so if we plug in this H to be this random variable, so what do we see here? So this is three, 10, we get that A I has to be less or equal than zero. And this implies, well, this holds for all I, um, we have that the sum of all i's has to be bigger or equal than zero. And we actually know that it has to be strictly bigger than zero um, as this sequence cannot be identical to zero by or first observation, which was three nine, right? Because here, I mean, would all the AIs be equal to um, zero, then this left-hand side in three nine would be zero as well. Okay, so we know that this is a strictly positive sum. 
And this is allows us to define probability measure, which was our original goal. So we define foreign probability measure um, um, Q, so this will be our marking images, which assigns the probability to omega i, namely a i, and now I need to normalize it that this is a probability measure. measure. Um, so we assign it yeah. no. So this is just to normalize it to one. Um, so omega i is of course omega. Oh. Let me make it. Okay. So So we need to show now two things, right? Um, we want to show that this Q we just defined does the job. And this means first we need to show that, uh, um, that this Q M is a martingale measure, right? So, I mean, it's obviously a probability measure, but we need to ensure that it's a martingale measure. Um, well, All right. How do we see in this? Okay. We take an alpha in our set alpha, so the predictor processes with various in our end. And then what we see that, well, If I look at plus minus the game process, this is equal to, right? I mean, this game process has linear structure, so this is equal to plus minus the game process here. And obviously these are elements in C, right? Because they are generated by the game process, so trivially they're dominated by one. And now we use again our observation 310. So let me show it to you again. Um, shear saying, okay, if I apply the linear function um, to some element in Z, then it's negative. So what we see is if we take the expected value under this measure Q of alpha T, right? now we just, what? I mean, this is a finite probability space, so we can calculate the conditional expectation as sum. Right, so this is the probability that the omega i appears multiply the gain in case of omega i appears, right? This, this is just calculating the conditional expectation. And now this is where 10 comes into play. It means this has to be less or equal than zero. But now I can do the same for minus alpha t. No, I, and this again, let's calculate it. Uh, and now you can make your minus if you want to. Um, and this is then again. Oh, doesn't matter actually. All right, this is again in C, so right minus, uh, so minus G, the minus the gain process of alpha at time T is again in C, so we can again apply 310 to ensure that it's negative. Okay, um, well, 
But now we have a random variable, which minus and plus has both the same uh, a non-negative, a non-positive expectation. So this means the expected value has to be zero. And this actually holds for all alpha and alpha, which is equivalent to saying this was one of the equivalent characterizations of um, omega being a martingale measure. So this was what we have proven in lemma 310, uh, 320, if you want to recall it. Okay, so this is, so the cure is indeed a martingale measure. And it's actually, it's a equivalent martingale measure because it's the science, every, every element a positive value. And now we want to show that it does the job we wanted to have from it. So we want to show that this was the claim in the lemma. So these martingale measures assigned our given random rival Z a strictly positive expectation. Okay, um, well, let's just calculate it. Oh, calculate, if, right. Um, so if we want to calculate this, we, well, we do the same, we, it's a discrete world, so we can calculate the expectation here as sums and this means a i z i what and well are these a i were constructed in a way that this is strictly positive and this was three nine right so if we go up here and look at three nine this is telling you, well, there has to be strictly positive. Okay. And that's it. I mean, this is the statement of Lemmer telling you if we have a non-dominated claim, then, I mean, it has to have a strictly positive. I mean, there is a martingale measure assigning that I have this claim a strictly positive expectation. All right, um, that's great because this is the, the final ingredients we needed to prove our first fundamental theorem at the head pricing. This is theorem 319. First fundamental, first fundamental theorem at the head pricing. Okay. Um, so this is the direction we actually want to prove. Um, so let me go back to the statement of the first fundamental theorem asset pricing. So what we want to show is if we have a finite um, arbitrage free market, then there exists an equivalent a martingale measure. Okay. So let's do this. So assume mm, E T S T is arbitrage free. Um, well, in terms of our sets L and C, I mean, this means the payoffs, which are um, positive, so they always give you a non-negative payoff, um, they are just zero. Well, this is what we have discussed already. Um, and now this means 
if I consider an omega, so if I consider the indicator function of one single omega, right? So this gives me a payoff of one if omega p is now at zero. Well, this is cannot be in C. Because this would be an arbitrage. Because it's a non-negative payoff. Um, with, yeah. So this means dot in C for all omega, omega, right? And now, what does it mean? So this is where our lemma, which we just proved, comes into play. So this is three. And it means, well, there exists for each of these omega. So let's call it omega, uh, Q omega. Exists a martingale measure with assigns this indicator function. So this is omega again, indicator function of omega. If I can calculate this again, right? So the expectation is just by the probability under Q omega, omega has to be strictly positive. This is, um, but we can do this for every omega. I mean, this is the ninth thing here. So we can do it for every omega. And this allows us to define, again, a new probability measure. Um, new measure. Um, let's call it Q. Because, I mean, this should be our martingale measure. Um, and this measure Q is given by, uh, so it's a discrete space, so I can, it's enough to, if I define it for every omega. So omega of Q is one over M, then the sum from one to M of omega Qi, right? So you could uh, construct for every, um, Omega i such a probability measure q uh, omega i and then I plug in this right. and the good thing here is well this does the job right um, and this is what I have to verify so first what we see is omega. So the probability under Q of each omega is strictly positive. Um, so this means Q is indeed equivalent to the measure PAP, so the physical underlying measure. Okay. And the second thing is we need to ensure that Q is indeed a martingale measure. Um, that's first thing. Second thing, well, let us do the calculation. So let us take the expectation under Q of the discounted price process at T. Again, let's calculate it by hand. Uh, I, T, I. But, but now these, like the, the Q omega I's are all martingale measures. So I can apply the martingale measure, uh, the martingale property under each of these omega, uh, measure Q omega I's. So this is nothing else then. Ah, now, well, we have one over M divided by, uh, multiplied with M. So that's exactly what we wanted to have. Um, so Q omega indeed does the job. So omega is an equivalent martingale measures and of course, 
this says if we have a martingale measures, the set of Kugler martingale measures is non empty. And just to remind you, so that we are basically we are, we are done with the proof now because the other implication. Um, is in the content of proposition 370, right? So we have already proven the other direction. Um, and this means we have completed now the proof of the first fundamental theorem as a present. Cool. So we now have fully characterized the property of the market being arbitrage free in terms of the existence of marking game measures. So we know now when a market is arbitrage free. Um, and this brings us to our next chapter. Okay, so because if we have an arbitrage free market, uh, we can start talking about pricing and hedging of the financial derivatives. Um, and we make our life beginning, consider the easier case, namely of European options. And so, Recall we had like two types of financial option, one where European, the other one where American. So European options, you can only exercise at the term limit in time, so at the maturity of the option, while American options, the content of the next chapter will be um, American option or financial option where you have additional exercise rights. So you can ex exercise the option at any time up to maturity. And this makes it a bit more complicated to price it um, and to hedges as well. But okay, this is something for the future. So let's start with the European option. Um, so this is so one central aim of net finance is the pricing and hedging of financial derivatives. Right. Uh, so this is the goal we start now and consider in the next two chapters actually. Um, um, and what we want to assume in order to do this, because this is the only way we can reasonably price any option, is we need to assume that our underlying financial market is arbitrage free. And so in our context, fulfill the no arbitrage principles. So what we assume that we have an underlying financial market, and if I'm not stating this, this is true for the whole um, chapter, so this is our underlying financial market. Um, and we assume that this market fulfills the no arbitrage principles. So in particular, it means no arbitrage. Um, so in particular, there is no arbitrage. And this means, and this you should always keep in mind, by the first fundamental theorem, we can always assume that there exists at least one equivalent martingale measure. Um, and this martingale measure will also play a crucial role in the um, contents of pricing and hedging of European option. All right. And since we have only proven it for the finite case, so we assume that we have a finite market. The ninth byproduct by this assumption is also that integrability of random rivals is never a problem because 
we have a finite space. So everything is basically integral. Um, okay. So this is underlying assumption. If I forget to state it in some context, this what you need to keep in mind. Because if the market is not arbitrage free, um, it's not reasonable, I mean, at least with our methods here, to price any option. And the finite one is to keep the mathematical level feasible. Um, okay. All right, let's start with the pricing and hedging. Um, chain of European options. Okay. Uh, okay. So, I mean, we have already started to discuss um, what a financial derivative or an option is, um, but now we have all the tools, the mathematical tools to be a bit more precise. So let me give you or recall for you the assumption of a European option. Mm. So here in this context, it's just a non-negative F tau. So this is actually all our random variable omega. Right. is called European option for contingent claim. Um, right, so this is, I mean, there are many words for it, they all tell you the same. So, mathematically speaking, there's just a non negative random rival. And why they are non negative? Well, because we discussed in the first section. So, if the payoff would be negative, we would not exercise the option because, well, why should we make losses on purpose? Um, so, we have to assume that's non negative. Um, but of course, already the assumption of ne negative has some financial ideas behind it. And well, uh, we also well want to talk about discounted claims um, payoff. So as usual, we discount by making A tilde above the object, above the xi. So this is just the discounted payoff. Um, so xi discounted by the risk free bond. Mm. Right, so let's. Um, oh. right. So as usual, I mean, we discount by making a tilde or. We discount by the risk free asset and make a tilde above the, pay, um, the corresponding payoff to indicate that it's discounted. All right. Um, okay. Let me recall some examples. I mean, this is the mathematical abstract definition, uh, but of course, I mean, one has some concrete examples um, which one like to think of. So these are examples um, for two. Um, right. Um, so we have two types of options. I mean, all, we like to distinguish between two types of options. One are um, vanilla options. Um, and this is not a mathematical rigorous definition, by the way. And this is just financial term um, um, are 
options with simple payoffs. Um, so the examples are European call option, which are, I mean, the most frequently traded one and European put. So let me, right, so you take an asset and this is your payoff. I mean, we have discussed them already. So let me quick here. And the put counterpart, you know, where you have the right to sell for a fixed strike price, the option at maturity time T, right? So these are both for um, a strike price K and maturity T. And I is of course, you can be, act on any of the risky assets one to D. Right, we have a market of D, financial op uh, D risky assets, so we can't pick any. Um, so this is, ah, let me make it properly. All right. Okay. Mm. Okay. And I promised you already in the introduction, there are more than just vanilla options we have already discussed. So um, the other like big class of European options are the so-called exotic options. Options. And here in general, the, the pricing and hatching problem becomes much more interesting and more complex because they are options which are um, uh, have some more complicated complex payoff. Hmm. Right. Um, uh, again, I mean, this is not mathematically speaking a rigorous definition, but this is financial language. Um, again, let me give you some examples uh, of exotic options. So first one, so there are, there are certain classes. So, I mean, I give you um, classes of option um, which are of interest in the financial market. First one are Agent option. Um, these are all types of option which depend on the average price in some sense, right? Um, it's in a wider sense. So you can take the geometric, the arithmetic average, the harmonic average, um, and this is fine. So you, you say, depends on the average of the price, um, like. Um, you take the well, the harmonic one. So, yeah. So the the arithmetic average. So you d divide by time, and then you sum up the price of the asset over time. Right? So you average the price of the part, um, and this gives you some type of average. Um, and the what well, an example. This for example is the Asian call option. Um, so how is this defined? Well, this is just the call option. So you have the payoff structure of a call option, but acting now on the average price over the pump. Okay. And you see here, I mean, this, this payoff is much more complex compared to a standard vanilla call option um, because for the, the vanilla options, you only need to know the price of the terminal time capital T. While here for the Asian call option, uh, you need to know the price really of the whole past. Right? So you need really the price from the beginning up to maturity in order to calculate the payoff. Uh, okay. 
next example. So Asian option are any type of option with depending on the uh, average. Okay. Next one is yeah, look back options. Back options. Right. Uh, so look back options are option which depend in some sense on the running maximum or minimum of the price. And on the running running maximum or running minimum of um, SE. Right. Um, um, for example, letters of uh, call. So look back call option is well you replace the strike price by the minimum so you have to write to sell the underlying asset as i at the terminal of time for the minimum for the minimal price over the whole maturity. So right, and this can of course act on any. Yeah. So what you agree on at the terminal time, you're allowed to sell the underlying asset as I for the minimal price which appeared on the market from zero to T. And this is then a look back call option. Um, but of course, I mean, the, the, this is just an example. So every type of option, depending on such a running maximum or minimum is assumed to be, or is said to be a look back option. And the last big class, which appears, um, are the so-called call options. Uh, sorry, so-called barrier options. So these are options we depend on the, I mean, the, the payoff reaches a certain level or, or region or does not reach it. Right? Um, so if you get a payoff or not depends on the, the whole trajectory of the price process, whether it has, um, hit a certain level or not. Um, so, may of provide payoffs depending where the price process reaches a certain level for maturity. Um, okay, again, let me give you an example. For example, uh, down and in put option. So the name says it all. So how is the payoff defined? So down and in is given by, well, you have a put option. 
if the process at some point, so for between zero and T, drops below the barrier B. And otherwise, well, you get zero. So you see, see um, in principle, you have a call option, but the call option is only active if the price process at some point while the option is alive hits, I mean, drops below the level B. Um, and here you see again, the, the payoff of the option depends really on the whole price trajectory of the underlying asset. Okay. So this is like the, the examples you want to keep in mind. Um, now the first question we have to study um, is I mean, if we want to sell or like consider option is what is the well, correct price or fair price or arbitrage free price? So this is, I mean, if we want to sell an option, we, we want to think about first how, I mean, for what price do we want to trade this realistic fair price, right? right? We, we need to find a notion what the price such of the claim is. Um, okay, so how do you find? So we need to develop an idea and the idea, I mean, should be realistic in the sense that the market stays arbitrage for, right? So, because I mean, if we want to sell an option, we don't want to create arbitrage because either we, we sold it for a too low price, then what well, we lose money because people will create arbitrage uh, in our cost, or we sell it for too high a price, and then since there's full information, no one will buy it because, well, why should you buy an option for which you surely lose money? So it will be not traded. Um, so we need to figure out um, the right level of price, not the price that we want to ask for an option. And our idea, well, generally in my finance, one idea goes as follows. Um, so the idea we want to consider is the following. Um, so we consider an option or a claim. Claim. Right. Um, and we want to put it on the market. And so. Um, our market is this risk-free asset and the de-risky asset. Went to um, sign. Right, so this is what we want to do. We have an option, we created an option, we want to um, put it on the market. Um, and well, if you do so, it becomes a trade object. Right, so then we put the we, we sell the option, and we assume that it's a liquid market. So we have to assume that the the option itself is then liquidly traded on the market. Um, if one of our no arbitrage principles was saying we have a liquid market. All right, so what happens is well, the market. Uh, well, this is our, well, the science. Mm. The claim, see, 
uh, price process. Um, process. Um, so, right. So if you put it on the market, the market has one traded asset more. So this is the, we have a D plus one risky asset. It's traded on the market, so we it gets assigned a price process because well it's traded, so we observe the prices. Um, so the, as a consequence, uh, we have now new. Uh, it's not really new. So the new and large market. So we have our risk free asset and our D risky asset. But now we have a D plot one asset, which is our traded claim. So consist of one risk free asset and D plus one risky asset. Okay. That's a new risky asset. Um, and okay, now we want to understand what, what this price process as D plus one should be. Well, the realistic assumption of our market, um, I mean, in our setting is that the, this market, every financial market or model for financial market should fulfill the no arbitrage principle. So what we want when this is what the correct price should fulfill is to say, well, the extended market should be arbitrage free or the enlarged market. Yeah. Large market um, so this should still be arbitrage free. Um, right. And this is because, well, as I said, I mean, we, we don't want to create arbitrage because if the price is too low, this would create arbitrage in our cost. Or if the price is too high, no one will buy it because no one is willing to create arbitrage on their cost. Um, so in particular, this implies, well, that at the terminal time by the law of one price, um, the price and the, for the option should be the option itself. Okay. Law of one price. And since the payoff at the terminal time is non-negative, well, the price process as T should be also non-negative. Because otherwise this would create arbitrage. Or TN. Okay. okay, this is the idea, right? There's so, I mean, it's not clear that this one exists or is unique in some sense, but this is some more reasonable price process. Um, and this is where we are going to make our definition now. Um, so this is definition 4.3. Uh, okay. Mm. What does this tell us? Um, so P, so R, I mean, this is so an element in R, so a real number is called arbitrage free price. Uh, Well, 
of the claim. Claim psi, you know, if there exists an adapted, right, prices, I mean, every price should not look in the future. So we need to assume that's adapted, drastic process. And we call this process a PT and depending on omega. And this process should fulfill the following condition, right? The process at time zero is equal to the price. Because I mean, this is, this should be the price. Um, we assume that the price is not negative, right? This is the assumption we're going to keep the market arbitrage free for t equal t. And at the terminal time, the price is given by the option. So, so this is the assumption on our price process. And okay, we will use this frequently. I mean, this is our chapter, so let's call it, give it a number for one such that the enlarged market feature T is one to T is arbitrage free, right? Uh, so we enlarge the market. Um, by this extra process, and we assume it should be still arbitrage free. Right. Uh, one. So sharing. Uh, right. Uh, all right. Um, okay. So this is our definition of an arbitrage free price. Of course, I mean, later on, we need to show that some surprise exists at all. Um, and now, let me continue this definition by saying, well, if this process omega, um, this process PT is unique, then we call it um, price process of the options guy, right? Uh, okay, maybe let me make this some colors so here, this blue, and this is the price process. All right, um, some final definitions for we start understanding if such a price exists at all. Um, so as I said, I mean, the, the price might be not unique, so it makes sense to introduce also the set of arbitrage free prices, capital pi um, is the set of all arbitrage Free prizes of psi and we define the minimal price of so the um, which is just the infimum of and the set of arbitrage free prizes, and they also define the maximum, oh, it's the supremum because it's not attended. Um, 
which is the supremum of all arbitrage free prices. Okay. Yeah, this is our definition, I mean, of arbitrage free prices based on the idea that we want to keep the market arbitrage free if we trade an option. Um, okay. And now the question is, how can we find such arbitrage free prices? Well, the idea we have used in the by a simple binomial model with one trading period was to say, well, if we have such an option, we should start looking for a replicating trading strategy, which is self-financing trading strategy, creating the same payoff um, as the given option psi. And if you have such a, a replicating trading strategy, well, then the correct price by the law of one price is the initial capital we need to realize this trading strategy. So this was the idea of replicating an option in order to find a price. Um, and what well, we can try this idea here as well, but this idea is somewhat limited um, to certain markets or certain option. So an option psi is called replicable um, or attainable if and it's a definition we want to make and this is the case if by definition there exists a self-financing trading strategy uh, excuse me, phi omega e such that well the trading strategy at the terminal at the terminal time gives exactly the same payoff as the option. This is sorry. All right. And then, if we have such an object, well, the law of one price will give us the right price for the option as well. Um. Okay, um, and that's all I used already the word of replicating trading strategy. So, um, in this case, phi is called replicating um, or hedging strategy. Um, right. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, I can also emphasize this. Okay. Yeah. So if you have such a self and strange strategy, we have this price. Um, and so Let's see how we get a price if we find a self-financing trading strategy, uh, self-financing replicating trading strategy. Uh, so, lemma. Point six, um, four point six. Well, um, we want to do. All right. So what we assume is as before, as I said, as always, we have a financial market where, which is assumed to be finite. 
so that we can apply the first fundamental theorem as a pricing. Um, and in order to make sense, I mean, that it's reasonable to price options, we want to assume that the market is arbitrage free. And on this market, we consider an option psi, which is assumed to be replicable. I mean, it's not clear that this is doable and we will see that it's not doable for all claims, but if we have a replicable trading strategy uh, for this option psi, well, what do we know? First, let's assume we have two replicating trading strategies. Uh, Um, for psi, well, then the associated value process of phi and psi are identical. So they are the same for all T and T. So, I mean, even while the, the, the train strategy could be different, the, the generated money by trading in the market with respect to fine psi, if they are replicating C, they are the same. And now in this case, so if the option is replicable, the price process and associated to this option psi, is uniquely determined by, well, we can take any replicating strategy, strategy which exists by assumption. And well, this gives you the price process. Uh, for any, well, since every give you the same, you can take any uh, G In particular, we know what the arbitrage free price is. Um, so the arbitrage free price is now given here by uh, this price process at time zero. And this is what, well, just take any trading strategy, uh, replicating strategy and take the initial value you need, you need for this. Okay. Um, so as long as you have a replicating, uh, a rep replicable claim, they exist a unique price and we can determine it by the same ideas as for the um, binomial model with one trading period. Okay, so let me give you the proof here. This is again, I mean, this is well, probably of every course. So you just put together what you already know. Um, so to recall it once, so why do we assume that the market is arbitrage free? Well, because we want to apply the first fundamental theorem of asset pricing. Um, which tells you there exists a equivalent Martin Game measure. since the market trash free. Okay, so we have this Martingale measure, which is equivalent to the underlying measure. Five. Okay, and we of course want to use it. Uh, and we want to first prove the first claim. So, so what we want to show is if we have two replicating trading strategy phi 
and psi um, then the associated value processes are the same. Okay. Um, well, so since they're replicating trading strategy, this means um, no, maybe. so what we know is if we look at the discounted value process associated to this two trading strategy phi and psi, this is content of um, the proposition is 3.17, which tells you that the um, discounted value processes um, psi and the discounted value process of C are martingales. under Q um, and well, since they're replicating strategies, we know that at the terminal time, the discounted value process of phi equals to the discounted value process of psi equals to well the discounted payoff. All right, so this is, yeah. And uh, now, how can we use this to show that the value process is the same? Well, if we now consider the discounted value process at time t of psi, well, we can use the Martingale property. So that's the same as the dis um, um, discounted value process at the terminal time, then conditioned on a t. Well, that's nothing else than well, the term of time is a replicating strategy. This is the same. Well, now psi is a replicating strategy as well. So this is the same and it's a martingale as well. So that's the same. This holds actually for all T and T. Um, okay, so what do you see from this equality? Well, let's move to the undiscounted counterparts. So for t, time t, the value process at of phi and the value of psi are the same q almost surely for all t and Okay, and now we use that Q is equivalent to P and omega is a finite set. Uh, uh, we don't need that omega is a finite set. We need that T is a finite set. Right. So this allows us to say phi is equal to t for all t p almost true. So that this finance sets allows us here to move the quantors around and that is equivalent means we can swap to the measure p. And this is actually what we claim. So if we have two replicating trading strategies for phi, then the associate value process are identical. Okay, that's good. And now we want to show that second claim, which tells us, okay, if I have a replicating trading strategy, I have also the price process. Persistence. Um, so again, let's take a replicating trading strategy, five. 
or any spider G Whatever again, strategy for phi. Um, first thing we note is that if we define well, the process PT equal to be the value process of phi, well, T, um then well the corresponding process here is adapted so we want to show that this process fulfills the assumption of arbitrage free price um so we need first to ensure that it's adapted this was easy um and since it's a replicating strategy, we know that at the terminal time, this process is equal to the option psi. That was easy as well. And now we want to show that it's not negative because then we are done. Um, uh, yeah, so as in the same calculation as we have done in I, what do we get here is that PT is equal to CT is equal to BT multiplied with the conditional expectation under Q of the discounted uh, uh, discounted option psi conditional. Right, this is the calculation we have done above here. But the, the ninth thing is since this is a non-negative random variable, we know that the conditional expectation is non-negative as well, right? So we see that this here and the process PT psi who follows all the assumptions um, of our definition Conditions of definition. So this was the definition of a arbitrage-free price. Okay, and so the only thing it's not missing to call it really a price process is the uniqueness. Mm. And for this, I mean, we do a proved by a counterpositive, which means suppose we have another um, uh, adaptive process um, let's call it as d plus one t such that um, well, the conditions of our definition are fulfilled. So the arbitrage free price are fulfilled. And we have that the price process, this price process here is unequal to our T PT zero. So for one, um, so there exists a time where these two price processes are unequal. So for some, right? Um, yeah. So how do we show that this is um, same? Well, by the definition, we know that the market here. is arbitrage free. Arbitrage free. Um, 
And this means by the law of one price, price, um, we have then VT zero, right? Because they have the same terminal payoff. And this means that P T zero here has to be equal to S T zero, which contradicts our assumption, which we started with, right? So this contradicts this here. Right. All right, so you see, if we want to keep the large market arbitrage free, the only choice we have is to take this process as D plus one to be equal the given process PT psi. This completes our proof and also our lecture for today. Um, all right. All right. Um, so thank you very much for watching the video and well, hopefully you watch the next one as well, where we continue pricing and hatching of European options.